I was in Nairobi, Kenya uh, last year, and we went to, we had Sabbath worship at a Maasai village where the people walked, some of them, an hour, hour and a half to get to Sabbath school on time. Well, well. Anyway, um, and it was interesting because they had this women's, women's choir, about 30 of them. And as they sang the, uh, the hymns of our beloved hymno, they sound good, but they were a little rigid. And then they transition to some native religious songs. And I saw some syncopations and some moves. And God has put something in us. And sometimes uh, tradition and culture will try to stifle it. When I was 13 years old when I became Seventh-day Adventist. And they told me I wasn't supposed to pat my leg and snap. And so I sang restricted, you know. Well, praise God, I've been delivered now, amen, hallelujah. And I, I, you know, it is amazing to watch the praise team. Now, now, all their songs were worshipful and good, but you saw what I saw. Something special happened on them last two songs. Holy Ghost jumped up in there and took it another level, amen. I'm not supposed to be preaching yet, but I got to tell you, praise God. Worship him. He's worthy to be praised. He's good, and his mercy is doing forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Mercy. Yes. Give him praise. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath. Um, it's been a little while since I've been here, but I want to thank your pastor for the invitation and uh, for the fellowship. And you have such a friendly church, <laughs> and it's amazing. Just the, just the testimony of meeting Chris and Crystal. I said something special got to happen up in here today, you know? And... Um, uh, I, I see the time, you guys. It's not it's, it's not difficult to see the time in your church, but I've come a long way, and I probably won't be back here anytime soon. So if you just let me take my time, Amen. God is good. You you uh, you know I will say uh, uh, greetings from Pacific Union Conference, your conference. Dr. Ricardo Graham, your president, and praise God. Y'all got some smart children up in this church. I mean, it is a blessing just to, can I just talk to you for a minute? It is a blessing to see that many young people in your church. You are blessed. I've gone to a number of churches, and they wish they had anywhere near what you had. And not only do you have a lot of children, you got some smart children. A little brother down here in the front, the storyteller's son. What was his name? Caleb. Caleb. I think he's going to be a preacher or a lawyer or something. And I, I asked his dad, how old was he? He said, five years old. I said, five years old. And then when I, I'm going to share a, a little story with you in a minute. But I believe that God had me to observe that and you just observe what happened there. Because the boy was engaged, connected. Dad, you're doing something right. Amen. He was engaged. And I think God gave me a little backup there so you'll believe something that I'm going to tell you in a few minutes. But I'm going to invite you to bow your heads right now as we acknowledge this awesome God of ours. Father in heaven, you owe us nothing but you offer us everything. And so we humbly bow our heads before you. We offer up our sacrifice of praise. Now we ask, Lord, that you will rain down upon us the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit that it may abide with us Lord so that when we leave this place today whether it's the music or the testimony or the fellowship or the message may we be transformed so people will see that we have not only been with Jesus but that Jesus lives within us who we ask in the precious name of Jesus amen so the title of the sermon today is the new normal it has nothing to do with the TV program that was canceled 
Some of you are familiar with that. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But the title of the sermon today is what? The New Normal. I want to read from my scripture, Luke chapter 4, verse 17 says, And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Praise God. During this month, we celebrate black history. But I want to tell you that I celebrate black history every morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, somebody. Uh, he didn't have to wake me up this morning, but he did, amen. And when I look in the mirror, I remember... I'm going to tell you, one morning I looked in the mirror, and I saw this hair right down here. I said, well, what's going on there? And then something told me, that's where your hairline used to be. <laughs> when your hair was all black. One of the reasons I wear a beard now is when it was all black, I couldn't wear a beard. But time. I said time. When we talk about time this morning, I said time has made a difference in my life. I've gone through some stuff. Praise God, I'm young. I ha I'm old, but I have been young. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. And as old as I get, I can still praise the Lord. Amen. You know, I wake up in the morning. It's like a ceremony. You know, I got a lot of air for a while. My eyes are open. Praise God, I'm still alive. You know, pastor, I look around. I can get up and put one foot ahead of the other. Praise God, God is good. If he did nothing else for me the rest of the day, I got enough to shout and praise him about regarding that. I'm glad to be here. Amen, praise God. So, so uh, I, I want to share with you as we talk about Black History Month, we celebrate that month. Praise God. If we forget our past, then our future is doomed. You got to remember where you come from. You come from somewhere. But the worst thing you could do is come from somewhere and go nowhere. Mm. God doesn't make any, any mistakes. And your paint job may not look like somebody else's paint job, but you're just as significant and important. Amen. And God has given us a heritage, a legacy, and he's given us a purpose. And so as I think about Black History Month, I thank God for what he's done in my life throughout these years. Uh, I am 66 years old, and I stop and I think about all those years, every morning, all day long, God gave me the ability to inhale and to exhale. What a blessing! And there are some of my peers who are no longer here. And I don't know how long he's going to keep me here, but may I do what he asked me to do while I'm here, amen. So, so in, in, in considering black history and the new normal, a, a colleague of mine uh, shared with me an experience um, uh, of his grandson who was in the first grade. We got any first graders around here? Raise your hand. Anybody in the first grade? Okay. Is there a children's church somewhere? Nobody in the first grade? Okay, we got a few. This young man, and what, what did you say the storyteller's son's name was? Caleb. Okay, well, I'm going to tell this story, and I'm not going to give any names, but I'm going to use Caleb's name because he reminded me of Caleb. And, and so this Caleb, all right, in first grade, and sometime prior to the event that I'm about to share with you, his mother informed him that it was Black History Month. Evidently, she made quite an impression on him regarding this, 
the significance of celebrating the history and contributions of African Americans uh, in the United States and, 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 and other people of color. The next day in his class, uh, Caleb, first grader, inquired of his teacher as to why they were not talking about black history. And she kind of ignored him. She gave him some inadequate answer. And, and he continued on with the class. He, it was not acceptable to, to him. He said, it's Black History Month. Why aren't you teaching us anything about black history? First grader. She ignored him again. So the next Monday, when he comes to class, he has not let go of this thing because it has not let go of him. And so he, he insisted, insisted to his teacher that they should be learning about black history. And, of course, his teacher put him off again. And, and, and he took out the sign he had so diligently worked on over the weekend, which was a protest sign. And he stood up and he announced to the teacher that until you start teaching us about black history, none of us are going to do any schoolwork. And I imagine the reason he got so much support is because they didn't want to do any schoolwork anyway. And Caleb just gave them a reason. Well, of course, he was carted off to the principal's office. Have mercy. Sometimes you got to suffer for what is right. He was carted off. Now, now let me say, it means the first graders, don't none of y'all try this at school, okay? <laughs> don't say Pastor Child. She was carted off. They called his mother. She came by, and, and she, he shared with her that the teacher was not teaching anything about black history during Black History Month. And she said, Caleb, I understand. I support you, but you got to handle this a different way. Caleb says, the normal way wasn't good enough. It was time for a new normal. Amen, somebody. And I don't know what's happening in your life. But if things are not going right, perhaps it's because it's time for a new normal. I was, I was reading about, uh, well, what psychologists say are some of the, the, the triggers or some of the signs of a person who is abnormal. Uh, and there were, there, were, there were several words and terms that were used. The first one was maladaptive. Okay, you look. People who are abnormal may be maladaptive. Uh, that means they fail to adapt to the demands of everyday life. Maladaptive. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Just look straight ahead. Because if you look in the mirror, I'm sure you can admit that every now and then you're maladaptive about some things. Amen? And then uh, another word that they used was unpredictable. Not only are the folk uh, maladaptive, but also uh, uh, they may be unpredictable. That means they, they, they lose control. They're erratic from one situation to the next. You know, one day this brother's like that, and the next day this brother's like that. And you don't know whether to say happy Sabbath or just get out of the way, you know? <laughs> and, and look, look, look. Folk come to church. In fact, you read the Bible. Most of what's written in the Bible was written for church people. All right. Another word that I saw was unconventional, which was, in short, behavior that is rare and unusual. Another term was distressing, suffering from several negative emotional distresses. Distress. And then, then finally, I'll, I'll leave you with this one. I'm sure there are probably others. Irrational. Acts in ways that are incomprehensible to others. Now, why did he do that? And now, before you get on somebody else, how many times have you asked yourself, why in the world did I do that? <laughs> Amen, lights. Amen, walls. And, and, and what I read was that at least two of these criteria, they don't necessarily mean that you, you lost your mind, but if two are present, it, it kind of uh, sets off a warning bell for the psychologist to look at this person more closely, okay? So don't go around psychoanalyzing and diagnosing people today, all right? 
the, the scribes and Pharisees had their minds made up about Jesus. He was a fraud. Satan thus influenced them to, to look for every opportunity uh, to prove their self-fulfilling prophecy. He has a demon, that's what they said. If we use the diagnostic tool of today's psychologists, in essence, the scribes and Pharisees would certainly conclude that Jesus was abnormal. However, there is one more factor involved in any psychological diagnosis. And that factor is the credibility of the one making the diagnosis. You know, we used to say when we were a kid, somebody called me stupid. Come on, I know, I heard it. I got a witness over here. Take one to no one. You got to be careful who you listen to, where you get your information from. Wikipedia is not always right. The internet is not always right. Your peer is not always, you're not always right. The credibility of the one making the diagnosis at the standard set by that society in, in which we live, that may not be legitimate. Is he or she qualified to draw the conclusions that they draw about you? You know some people say some terrible things about you. Amen. I remember somebody, my name is Virgil, and I remember somebody called me Vernon, and then they called me Victor. And, and someone else spoke up and said, what's wrong with you? So disrespectful. You can't even call a guy by his right name. Calling him Victor and Vernon, his name is Virgil. To which I begin to kind of accept the realities of life, and the reality of life is that I'm not perfect, neither is anybody else, and sometimes people mean well. And I just simply responded, I said, you know what, I've been called worse things than Victor and Vernon, so I kind of like Victor and Vernon over those other things, you know? <laughs> but the question is today, as we consider, uh, 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 you know, who we are as a people during this Black History Month, and my question is, who is really abnormal here? Uh, they said Jesus was abnormal, but who really is abnormal here? I want to suggest to you today that with all the chaos we are experiencing in our world today, and Lord knows we got some chaos. You know, I had to ask the Lord, you know, I've had to ask the Lord to deliver me from a number of things, but probably the most ridiculous thing I've had to ask him to deliver me from is MSNBC. And, 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 and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it is, it is, it is an addiction because, because you keep hoping that things are going to get better. You keep hoping that number 45 will be dealt with. I said, well, maybe I'm hoping the wrong thing. But I, I'm telling you, it seemed like no matter that man must be Teflon. He must be made out of Teflon because everything just slide right off of him. All right. Let me not get political. They said confession is good for the soul, but it's bad for the reputation. So I'm going to let that go right now, you know. Who is really abnormal? Our society, normal, normality is not enough. We need a new normal. And I want to suggest to you today that Jesus is the new normal. Amen. I said Jesus is the new normal. In the verses prior to our scripture reading, uh, there's an account of Satan's attack on Jesus. In the wilderness of temptation. Look at verse 13. It says that at the end of the confrontation, the devil departed from him, that is Jesus, for a season. I'm going to tell you something, man. The devil is evil. And, and, and in fact, e, do you, wait, you know how you spell devil? You spell evil and put a D in front of it and you got devil. The devil's evil. And, and just when you think you got the, you may have the victory now, but I guarantee you he's only gone for a season. That's why you got to stay prayed up, amen. 
Pray it up. The, 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 the end of the com, com, confrontation, the devil departed from him for a season. Jesus then returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Have mercy. You see, if you remember, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And it says when he, when he resisted the devil, he came back. He came back in the power of the Spirit. Now, he, he was already powerful going into the desert. And just think, uh, the Scripture said he was even more powerful coming out of the desert. Can I, can I just slip this in for a minute? I had an a, a old preacher tell me, Baptist preacher, he tells me, he said, Charles, uh, if you're going through hell, don't stop. He said, because if you stop, you'll never get out. He said, if you're going through hell, just keep on going. One foot ahead of the other and pray your way through that thing. And I want to leave that for you today. If you're going through something, don't stop. Keep going. Keep praying, keep pushing, keep hoping. Come on, somebody. I think. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Jesus resisted the devil, you know. And, and you know, uh, uh, today we seem to do the opposite. We seem to be uh, uh, addicted to sin and allergic to God. Addicted to sin and allergic to God. But what Jesus did, Jesus spoke truth to power. Oh, yes, I wish I had somebody. He used the word of God against the devil. Now, now, if you don't know the word, you can't use the word. And if you don't have the word to use, guess what? You lose. Jesus was victorious over the devil as he spoke truth to power. He made the devil accountable. The devil didn't want to admit it. You know, many times folk will not admit when they're wrong. That's all right. We still have a responsibility to speak the truth in love, but speak the truth. You know, you know, Caleb in our story, he spoke truth to power. He said, it's Black History Month. You ought to be teaching us about black history. He called for authority to have, to have some accountability and do what was right. And we got to do the same thing. As citizens of the United States, as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you all taping this? There's all kind of stuff going around out there. I don't want to be misunderstood, but I must speak truth to power. So I don't care how much power you got. God expects you to be accountable. Can I slip this in right quick? Everybody's got to answer to somebody. Why not answer to God? I remember my children, uh, they were attending a particular school. And they were spending more time at the school than they were with me. Well, a, a particular thing happened with my son. Uh, somebody broke into his room and took some money. And then the following week, they broke in and they took some clothes. Well, this disturbed my wife. And she called and talked to the dean. The dean said that he would take care of it. Well, three months later, the dean hadn't done anything. And in fact, when my wife called to talk to him, uh, uh, the dean says, look, I got a lot to do here. If you want to come look for it, investigate yourself, you can do that. Well, that's the wrong thing to say to a black woman. <laughs> so I come home from board meeting, and when I walked in, I know my wife, I looked at it, I could tell oh, something has disturbed her, and she shared with me what I just shared with you. So I got on the phone. She says, well, who are you calling? You calling the dean? He ain't going to do nothing. It's part of my grammar. Uh, uh, he's not going to do anything. I said, I'm not calling, I'm not calling the dean. Because he already knew when my kids got ready to go to that school that there might be some conflict and some difference of opinion. You got to understand, just because folks are Christian, that doesn't mean that they're perfect. Amen. <laughs> And, and if I could take it or further, take it further, there's some people who are right, who are religious, but they're not righteous. They will, they, they, they spend more time with, with policy than, than with prayer. You know, you're, y'all taping this, this may be my farewell sermon to ministry, I don't know. But I must speak truth to power. And, and, and the Holy Spirit told me to do this. I didn't call the president, and I didn't call the dean, and I didn't call the principal. I called the sheriff's department. Right, I sure did. And I asked the sheriff, I said, uh, do you have jurisdiction over this particular area? He said, yes. I said, well, this is what has happened. 
And it was some distance away from my house. He says, well, when you get about a half an hour out, give me a call and I'll meet you at the school. After then, I hung up, you know, you know, you know, God, you know, he had, sometimes he'll take you through a process so you can understand and you can see that uh, there was nobody but God that could do this, you know. And so then I called the principal, not the dean, but the principal. And I said to the principal, I said, look, uh, this is Elder Virgil Childs, pastor of Seventh-day Adventist denomination, same denomination that you belong to. And, uh, and uh, this particular situation has happened, and we've talked to the dean. He's been very rude. And so I want you to know that I've also talked to the uh, sheriff's department, and we will be arriving on your campus in about an hour and a half. Oh, that man got excited. You know, if you, you want to get some, you want to get some attention, you, you, rat, you, you, know, you rattle the blinds, you, rat, you know, you make noise, you put rocks in your wagon so people can hear you. Because people will ignore you with their self-righteous self. <laughs> and, 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 but that man said to me, he says, look, I didn't know anything about this. Before you, before you follow up, let me do some investigating and let me make a call. I'll call you back. That man called me back five times that night. And I remember my son, my son, he didn't, he didn't want no drama. He says, Dad, Dad, don't do that. I said, look, when, when you get to be my age and you have a son your age and somebody breaks into his room and takes his stuff and then those who are in charge disrespect you, then you understand. But in the meantime, if that man doesn't call me back, we're coming up there with the police. <laughs> I digress a little bit. But sometimes you got to speak truth to power. And if you're on the Lord's side, guess what? You've already won. It may not look like it, but you've already run. I, I, so having the paint job that I have, every now and then I find myself speaking truth to power. To those that have the advantage over me who appear to have the disadvantage. But what they don't know is that they don't know that I know who I know and I belong to who I belong. Amen. Amen. So they get Jesus up. Our scripture says that Jesus comes up and they offer him uh, uh, the pulpit. And it was customary in the synagogue uh, service to ask visiting rabbis to read the scriptures lesson and make whatever comments they wanted to make. By this time, Jesus had been preaching for about a year, and so he was pretty popular. He, those who didn't believe him, they were still curious. And they wanted to hear what he had to say. So on this particular Sabbath, the church leadership invited him, go ahead, take the pulpit. And for his text, we read, it was referenced from Isaiah 61, 1 to, through 2. And so he had a three-point sermon, which is less than what I have today. Amen. And the first point is he announced that the scripture was fulfilled in him. That's pretty bold. That's pretty bold. Weren't you born in Nazareth? You know? Aren't you illegitimate? Oh, you know how we do. We can, we can, we can, we can just run down all your faults. Ask us to say something good about you. It becomes a challenge. But they rag on Jesus, and here he is now, just like them, human, praise God, yet without sin, amen. Praise God even more so. He says this scripture is fulfilled in me this day. He was, he was anointed by the Spirit to minister to the poor. He was anointed by the Spirit to minister to the brokenhearted the captives, the blind, and the bruised. And then his second point, Jesus says, uh, he announced that the year of Jubilee had begun. That's the acceptable year. That's the year when after 50 years, everything has to be restored and replaced and, and, and put back into his original position. You know, praise God. God promised that he would not, trouble wouldn't last always. Can I, can I say that? Uh, trouble won't last always. God, God has a solution to this thing. God has an end to this thing. And the third point, he announced that all of this was not something the Jews earned or the people of earth earned. All of this was by grace. All of this was because of a heavenly father. In spite of our chaos, our, our, our addiction to sin and all of that stuff, God's grace 
Because, you know, there's nothing more he wants to do than to save us. It's a, it's a, it's a shame that he has to work so hard to give us eternal life. He goes on in his sermon as he follows to share two examples that the grace of God is not just for for Adventists, excuse me, that the grace of God is not just for black people, excuse me, that the grace of God is not just for Jews, but for Gentiles also. So so he mentions mentions further down uh, 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 the widow that that Elijah came to and, and there was a famine in the land and and, and, and how he blessed her. He, he, he mentioned Naaman, the leper. He said there were many lepers. But he only, Jesus, he says that, 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 that the prophet only went to one, and that was Naaman. And these two folk were Gentiles. Mm. They were Church of God in Christ. They were not Seventh-day Adventists. Look, I have nothing against Seventh-day Adventists. I is a seven day Adventist. <laughs> I, I knew y'all were going to correct me, but go ahead. That's all right. I, I am not only a seven day Adventist, I am a black seven day Adventist. And I am, I am proud of what God has done with me in spite of myself, in spite of said. And I am humble enough to understand that he's not through with me. He got a long ways to go. You don't believe me, ask my wife. I told her she better be gentle with me because I'm her pastor too, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing. The first two points of Jesus' sermon was acceptable. When, but when he started talking about the, the, that grace is also extended to the Gentiles, the Jews didn't want to hear that. Haters! Yeah, haters, that's what they were. Which leads me to the topic of privilege. Mm, can I talk about that? Now, I, I just want to say this to you. You know, I, I want to be very transparent today because too many times we try to sanitize things or pretend that things do not exist. We, one elephant, pink elephant in the room, we got a whole bunch of elephants. And one of the reasons we have so much conflict is because we refuse to communicate about reality. Reality is that you know, on this planet, and Jesus knew that it was the same way with reference to the Jews is that there are some folk who are privileged. Okay. Now, I'm sure all of us can find that we are privileged in some way or another, but this kind of privilege I'm talking about, you know, has to do with, uh, with, with white privilege. Oh, yeah. See, I knew it was going to get quiet. And no amens. And you must understand I am not attacking a people. I'm attacking a system. That is unlike what God wants us to represent. He, he wants us to love everybody. Amen. It's not his, his preference that the majority of us worship only with people that look like us. That's not his preference. But God is a God who winks at a time of ignorance and he accepts what, what we are doing until we can do better. Amen. But, but I want to keep it real this morning. You invited me all the way from uh, uh, Pittsburgh, California, which is about 741 miles, I'm sure you didn't call me here to entertain you. I come to tell you the truth. I got a message. I not only have a message, but I have a message based on experience. I have a message based on the reality that I have as a result of being a black man in America. Uh, 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 White privilege uh, uh, says, and, and, and look, look, and there are those who are, who are aware that they have this advantage. And there are those who have no clue that they have this advantage. But it's a default because of how sin has messed up our societies, our communities. Amen. So that so much that, that there are some things. Well, well, I read a definition. I'll just give it to you. A special right, when we talk about privilege, a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. Talking about privilege. Let me go, let me go further. The Washington Post in January 16, 2016 says, what is white privilege? It's the level of societal advantage that comes with being seen as the norm 
in America, automatically conferred irrespective of wealth, gender, or other factors. And you know, sometimes uh, I re I'm reminded that there is this white privilege, or at least that I am disadvantaged as opposed to the alleged advantage. And I'm sometimes, you know when I can tell it sometimes in the simplest situations, sometimes I'm sitting in my car and someone with a different paint job will come park next to me and they don't realize that I'm in the car. But then they'll get out. And now they've already locked the car. As they walk away, they turn and they look at me and all of a sudden they got to click that thing three or four more times. I told my wife one time, I said, I'm going to yell out the window and say, I'm going to break in that car anyway. I don't care how many times you... But, but understand what I'm saying. If we're going to get somewhere, we have to at least understand what the problem is, what the issues are. You know, you can be in conflict with someone and you can have, you can have your position with reference to the issue and they can have their position with the reference to the issue and try to resolve things. But as long as you're holding on to your position and they're holding on to their position, you'll never, you'll never resolve anything. What you got to do is find out where is the common interest. The common interest is that we want a better neighborhood. The common interest is we want to stop all the violence. The common interest is we want to, we want to make things better for our children. And, and when we come together on the common interest, in fact, the best interest we can come together on is God's interest. True success is when God gets what he wants. And if God gets what he wants, guess what? The rest of us will get what we need. Amen. Uh, 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 but I'm looking at, at this thing of privilege. I'm looking at my experience, and we have to deal with the realities. Uh, I went to visit a friend, and uh, he had a new car. We got to his house late, and, uh, but he wanted me to go for a ride in his new car. And so we went out, and it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. That should have been a red flag. That ain't no, you don't need to be out at 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, he and I looked the same. Well, well, he reached down to do something, and the car swerved a little bit. And guess what? Just when you think, yeah, the cop shows up, the officer shows up, and I love officers. Thank, praise God for officers and what they do, the good ones, all right? And, 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 uh, and, and he pulled us over. He pulled us over. And, the, and, the, and the, my friend tried to exegete the situation. <laughs> he tried to reason and dialogue with the officer. Pastor Howard, Chaplain Howard, you know the reality that I came up in. I, I grew up in Oakland. And my reality says that when an officer pulls you over, you keep your mouth shut, but that's not all you better do. I put both my hands on top of the dashboard. <laughs> I didn't want any mistakes, misrepresentation. But that's the reality that we live in. And I refuse, I could use that and just say I'm a victim, but I refuse to be a victim because I'm a child of God. And the Bible tells me no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Amen, somebody. The first two points, those, those, those Jews agreed with, but the third point of Jesus' sermon, they disagree. With. Why give grace to the Gentiles? Because you know what? God loves the Gentiles. And there but for the grace of God, who knows where I might be or what I might be doing? So this whole thing of privilege, certain things that happen by default, certain things that, 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 that privileged people, uh, they, they get in terms of buying a house or, 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 or a job or wealth or some of these other things simply because of how they look on the outside. And I could talk till I'm blue in the face telling folk, it doesn't matter what you look like on the inside. We all the same color on, on the outside. We all the same color on the inside. Amen. My brain is the same color as their brain. Mm. I guess y'all must be hungry. <laughs> but what we have here in the book of Luke is the social gospel. It's not enough to praise God in the sanctuary. You got to praise him in the hood also. And you got to praise him in the suburbs. Amen. We find in Luke's gospel numerous sayings of Jesus regarding those with material possessions, having a responsibility to the poor and, and disadvantaged. 
He attacks the racism and discrimination against the untouchables that exist. And the untouchables were, were those folk like the lepers and the Samaritans and the Gentiles and the tax collectors and, 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 and women and the poor who had no voice. But as Jesus comes on the scene and he says, that's been your norm, but it's time for a new normal. It's time for those women who have the same gift of, of pastoring that men do to get acknowledged and recognized for the same. Can I give you a little, little, little information on protests that the Pacific Union did? Uh, there's a particular president, female president in our union, and um, they declined to put her name into the Seventh-day Adventist yearbook simply because the qualifications, that the, the norms that they set up, and she didn't meet those norms. Well, we decided that if you don't put her name in the book, we don't want our names in the book. You know, you got to speak to power. You know, you got to stop putting policy over doctrine. You got to stop running the church by policy and run it by prayer. Amen. I'm not attacking people. I'm attacking a system where this D-E-V-I-L devil sets up, tries to pit us against each other so that we cannot glorify the name of Jesus. He's the one that suffers the most out of all of this. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have a love, one for another. Now, you know, back in the day when I was 20-something years old, whatever, preaching, I never preached a sermon like this. But God has taken me through some stuff. You know? And we have a responsibility. Uh, I think about the civil rights movement. You know, Jesus, the new normal, says, I am the truth. Speak power to truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth. Nothing else. The truth. Amen? care how smart you are. If it's not the truth, it ain't going to do nothing for you. But the gospel, the truth of the gospel is dynamic. It is transformative. Amen? So then I, I think about uh, civil rights. And I remember once Barack Obama said um, to say that we have not accomplished anything through the civil rights is to be disrespectful for those people who gave their lives who fought off the water hoses and the dogs. He said, what is probably more appropriate to say is that we just haven't done very well with what we have. And so we shouldn't be satisfied. But in the book, it's a good book, you should get it and read it if you have time, The Seventh-day Adventist and Civil Rights Movement by Samuel G. London, Jr. Seventh-day Adventist and the Civil Rights Movement. He cites a portion of Holly Fisher's article in 2003 titled Oakwood College Students' Quest for Social Justice Before and During the Civil Rights. And, you know, I'm sharing this stuff with you because when, when, when I was coming up as a, as a youth, you know, I was told, uh, stay away from politics, you know, don't get involved, be in the world but not of the world, you know. And that, that kind of created a wedge, you know, between us and the people who are out there dying, going to jail, and we or experience the benefits of their sacrifice. What about us? We're sitting on the sideline. You know, we're like that, we look like that, that, that football team that, that, that always huddles but never runs a play. Or like the baseball team that always stays in the dugout, never gets out on the field. Have mercy. Uh, uh, so this is what she says in her estimation. She says, Apocalyptic, and, and, and you know, bear with me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get there e eventually. Apocalyptic historical eschatology, the doctrine concerning, you know, this last day events, the study of last day events, the doctrine concerning Christ's second coming and the destruction of the world led Adventists to assume a laissez-faire attitude. You know, we had no sense of urgency in terms of us participating in the civil rights movement. Not all of us, there were a few. There were a few, but the majority of us did not, not because we didn't care, but because the theology that we were being told suggested that we were out of place if we participated in any protests or, mar you know, marches. 
Uh. Is, is this too much? No, I need to go back to the milk. See, see, we, if we're going to celebrate Black History Month, we, we, need, we need to know from whence we've come. Somebody told Dr. Uh, Elder, asked Elder, Bro, Elder um, Bradford, they said, Elder, Elder, uh, as young preachers, uh, what advice could you give us about, about preaching? He says, first, you, play, you paint it black. You paint it real black. You talk about how bad things are. He said, then you give them the gospel and watch them light up and be transformed. You, uh, you got to understand, before the good news is good to you, you got to find out what the bad news was. Mm, mm, mm. She says, she says that since Adventism advocates Christ's return as a solution for society's problems, adherents tend to perceive sociopolitical activism as unnecessary. In addition, sectarian ecclesiology, the doctrine that Christians are not to conform to the secular world, caused Adventist leaders to admonish members to disassociate themselves from political causes, social political responsibility belongs to God, not humanity. In essence, our theology and our understanding of theology was that God is coming and he's going to clean all this stuff up when he comes. So in the meantime, just keep praying, just keep feeding a few people, you know, and, 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 and fold your hands and say it is well with my soul because when Jesus comes, he's going to take care of it. But you know what Jesus said? He said for us to occupy until he comes. And occupy doesn't mean just sit and wait. Uh, occupy means you need to do the work that I've, I've told you to, to do. You need to preach the gospel, not only in what you say, but how you live. And not preach the gospel just to those who look like you. You need to sow besides all waters, amen. You need to get out and get involved in community engagement. He says justice and mercy, that, that's what you got to do. And, and, and sometimes people are not just. Well, you need to speak truth to power and talk about it. Sometimes folk are not merciful. You need to speak truth to power and talk about it have mercy I feel like I'm running for president right now but God God is good and it's the truth anyhow if you give me 10 more minutes I'll wrap this thing up because I believe you're getting this message and the message is you have any reservation in, in, in your mind about whatever normal you've been following as a result of false, false theology then, then you need to get with the new normal Jesus says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's called me to teach a social gospel. He's called me to get involved with the widows and with the orphans, amen, with the blind. And, amen. Dr. Luce tells us in our scripture, Jesus brought us a new normal. Vote. Amen. Someone told me, I was pastoring the Market Street Church. They said, we don't need to, to get too involved in what's happening in this neighborhood. So I was out taking a couple of folk who had nowhere to stay to find a place. And as we passed uh, a particular block not far from the church, there, was, uh, there were markings, about seven or eight markings. And the police vehicles were there. And the coroner's office were there because someone had been shot and killed. That was on a Friday. Sabbath, when I went to church, I found out it was the fiancé of one of my members. So you can tell yourself, I don't want to get involved. But it's too late. Welcome to the struggle. You're already involved. When you were born, you were involved. Now you're in a battle for eternity. Either you're going to spend eternity separated from God, or you're going to spend eternity with God. You know, the Bible talks uh, uh, about streets of gold and gates of pearl, and, and it talks about a tree that bears 12 manner of fruit throughout the year. And all of that stuff is beautiful, you know, but the center and the focus of heaven is Jesus. And you can't have the streets of gold and the gates of pearls right now, but you can have Jesus today. He's right here. He's available for you today. Amen. But if you're going to have him, you've got to follow him. You've got to be like him. And Jesus did not rest until he preached the gospel and prepared a church poor and enfeebled as they were. Jesus still, uh, they were the, the, the object of his regard. So, so I have one more word I want to give you and I move this thing along. And that other word is slave. Now, how can we talk about 
black history without talking about slavery. Jesus in Luke addresses a new concept. The Bible uses a host of terms to identify the followers of Jesus. Scripture describes us as aliens, as strangers, citizens of heaven, lights to the world, salt of the earth, you know, but even, even light and salt, uh, in, in addition to light making it possible for you to see, you know, if you, you, you sleep and somebody turn the lights on, that disturbs you. And while salt may be used as a preservative, if you get it in your eye, it irritates you. So some of us all need to understand that not only are we supposed to be here with these good things, but, but we're supposed to preach the gospel for those who are wicked to irritate and disturb them to the point that they can't rest until they see Jesus. Amen. But, but we are called sheep and ambassadors, members of the body of Christ. We're called friends. Uh, we're called to compete like athletes. We're called to fight like soldiers. Uh, we are called uh, uh, branches on a vine. Um, um, we are called newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the word. It's all, it's all a unique way to help us to understand what it means to be a Christian. However, there is one metaphor more frequently used than any of, of these, and that is the word slave. Now, in your Bible, it's usually the word doulos is usually translated servant. And one of the reasons it's translated servant, and I have to fast forward a little bit here, is because... You know, the, 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 the Bible scholars didn't want us to associate the word slave with the European slave trade. So they said, let's clean it up. And when we translate doulos, instead of saying slave, let's say servant. But you got to understand, that kind of mutes the point when we say that we are servants and not slaves. Because God knew what he was saying. And he meant what he said. And if he said slaves, then he meant slaves. So why are we trying to change something? We're trying to change it because that's what we always do. We, we try to sanitize it to make it sound better. But the truth of the matter is God knew what he was talking about. And I was, I was looking at the contrast between slave and servant. A servant, servants are hired and slaves are owned. Servants have an element of freedom in choosing whom they work for and, and what they do. The idea of servanthood maintains some level of self-autonomy and personal rights. Slaves, on the other hand, they have no freedom, autonomy of rights. In the Greco-Roman world, slaves were considered property, property, to the, the, the point that in the eyes of the law, they regarded as things rather than human beings. To be someone's slave was to be his possession, bound to obey his will without hesitation or argument. Now, I think you see where I'm going. For to be a slave with the wrong master is a bad thing. But to be a slave with the right master is a better than good thing. Oh, my. The, the American folk song, uh, uh, Follow the Drinking Gourd. For the old man is waiting to carry you to freedom if you follow the drinking gourd. That was a code that says, look, the Underground Railroad is in town. And if anybody want to be delivered, you know, tonight is the night. Come on out and join us and we're going to lead you on to freedom. And I read the, the word of God and when it says spiritual things are spiritually discerned, I'm understanding that it is the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us understanding beyond the understanding of those who have PhDs and, and, and MAs and all those things who are secular as opposed to being spiritual. Amen. I, I'm here to understand as I look back over the history of, of black people and, and this thing of slavery that, yes, being under the wrong master was a terrible thing. It was difficult to be a slave. And, and even the, some of the slaves who, who, who tried to escape, most of them lost their lives. But it was difficult to be a slave. And, you know, I, I was reading it, it says, you know, some of the slaves played games. You know, some of them act dumb like they didn't understand what was being said. You know, some of them called in sick, you know, and said, I can't work today. I ain't feeling good. You know, they did the same thing we do every you do every now and then. <laughs> but I want you to understand what God did. He took 
as he usually does. He takes the worst that sin can provide, and he turns it around for the glory of God. I, I think about, about Lazarus when he died. And Jesus shows up four days later and his sisters say, if you had been here, he would not have died. And Jesus says, he'll live again. He says, well, we know he'll live in the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the new normal. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. And all I have to do is speak because I am power. And he'll come on. He'll take the worst that sin has to offer and turn it around to his glory. The cross. The cross was a, was a thing of, of, of shame. But because Jesus hung there and died, amen, he stretched them wide, amen, he hung his head and died. The cross now has become a thing uh, uh, that, that, that identifies with victory and hope. God will take the ugliest thing that sin has and turn it around for the glory of God. He'll take your problems. He'll let you go through it for a while. And just when you think it's all over, he'll turn it around, give you a new normal for the glory of God. Oh, he'll let your kids act crazy and you think there's no hope for them. And just when you think it's all over, they become doctors and lawyers and preachers and deacons and So, so in answer to a question of, Lord, why are you allowing all this to happen? It's because God is trying to save everybody. And so he takes those stigmas of negativity and he turns them into the glory of God. You know, sometimes you say, you say, yeah, Lord, yeah, I know you're great and you're good. I believe in you and everything. You know, just like Job. He said, but where's, where's, the, where's the blessing in this? I lost everything, my sores all over my body. Uh, you know what I've come to learn? I've come, come to learn. I didn't learn this through any Greek exegetical, uh, you know, exegesis. I learned from experience that God will take the worst and give you the best. That God will turn back your trials and your troubles for his glory. You see, the biblical usage of doulos was unequivocally a bad thing. But now Jesus has turned around. So, so I, I, I want to close with this. That we, we talk about uh, uh, the new normal. Christianity is not about adding Jesus to my life. Instead, it's about devoting myself completely to him, submitting wholly to his will, and seeking to please him above all else. Praise God. Praise God. The world has messed up, but Jesus has got a new normal. We have been adopted by Jesus. Amen? And you know, when you get adopted, you get everything the natural born children get. Heirs to everything the parent has. I, I thank God that uh, he has changed me and that by his grace, he is using me to do the work that must be done before Jesus comes. The, 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 it's not enough for me to simply sit here and sing about how good God is. I've got to go out and show somebody. A husband or your wife was going to be one and God planted a tree on a hill called Calvary God says they may feel hopeless now but I'm giving them a new normal and I'm making provisions ahead of time for their salvation I don't know about you but I want the new normal I'm not perfect I, for me for me perfection is a direction for God, perfection is a state of being. But I'm satisfied with being pointed in the right direction. God, who is willing and loving and merciful, says that he will save me. And he will give me the ability to speak the truth. He will give me the ability to trust in him. And my life will never be the same. I believe in social justice. I believe in community engagement. 
but I believe most of all in God. And if I trust him, he will lead me, provide for me, and give me just exactly what I need. What about you? What about you? Now, I know I must have gone over time. But for today, that's the new normal. Bow your heads, please. Father in heaven, we thank you that you've given us a message and that you are a God who's promised never to leave or forsake us. We thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus at a time when the world was...